Hi, in my next videos I'll talk about the idea that the fundamental forces which govern our universe and the fundamental constants have them in some way finely tuned to allow for our existence. Or, in the words of the late great Stephen Hawking, The laws of science, as we know them at present, contain many fundamental numbers, like the size of the electric charge of the electron, and the ratio of the masses of a proton and the electron. And the remarkable fact is that the values of these numbers seem to have been very fine adjusted to make possible the development of life. These ideas have been covered in a number of books. The Cosmological Anthropic Principle is quite a heavyweight book, written back in 1986 by theoretical physicists and popular science writer John Barrow and Frank Tipler, an American theoretical physicist. This book set out many known examples of fine tuning and constraints. Another very readable book is by Martin Rees. He's the current British Astronomer Royal. Just six numbers, the deep forces that shape the universe. And just for the record, here are Rees's six numbers. Another popular book is by Paul Davis. He is, again, he's a theoretical physicist, but also a popular science writer. His book is Cosmic Jackpot, Why Our Universe is Just Right for Life. Although I've talked about three books, there are many, many more. But first, let's have a little bit of background. We believe our universe is 13.8 billion years old. It began in a state of exceedingly high density, which we call the Big Bang. And it's been expanding and cooling ever since. If we average out over our entire observable universe, the average density is only 9 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms per cubic metre. This is an incredibly low figure. It's equivalent to around about seven atoms of hydrogen per cubic meter, so an incredibly low number. And this consists of roughly 5% ordinary matter. So that's the ordinary stuff that everyday things are made of, but also includes stars, galaxies, um, planets, asteroids, comets. Everything we can see, touch, feel is made of ordinary matter. 27% is dark matter, and this is matter which we believe must exist, but we don't know in what form it is. It's some as yet undetected strange form of matter. But the bulk of the mass of the universe is in the form of dark energy, and this is the thing which is causing the universe to expand, to speed up. So although it's energy, Einstein told us that matter and energy are equivalent. So by E equals mc squared, it has a mass equivalent of 68% of the mass of the universe. The workings of our universe are governed by four fundamental interactions, which are electromagnetism, gravity, the strong interaction, and the weak interaction. And what I'll do is I'll talk about these fundamental interactions next. OK, the first of these is electromagnetic force. This acts on electrically charged particles. Um, electric charge can be either positive or negative. So if charges have the same sign, so they're both positive or both negative, it's a repulsive force. If charges have different signs, so it's um, positive and a negative charge, it's an attractive force. The electromagnetic force between two charges follows an inverse square law. If the charges are in coulombs, which is a standard unit of charge, distances in metres, then the force will be in newtons. In this expression, the symbol epsilon is the permittivity, 
and the perimeter of a vac vacuum is given the special symbol epsilon naught. This force is also called the electrostatic force or occasionally the Coulomb force. It's this electrostatic force which holds atoms together. It binds the negatively charged electrons into orbits around the positively charged atomic nucleus. So this diagram shows the representation of a lithium atom. Three negatively charged electrons are in orbit around the nucleus, which has three positively charged protons and four neutrons, which don't have any electric charge. Though in reality, although diagrams like this are commonly um, used, they are oversimplifications. The electrons don't orbit the nucleus in circular orbits. Instead, they are found in orbitals defined by the rules of quantum theory, which is too big a topic to cover in this video. The electrostatic force is responsible for chemical bonding, which causes atoms to combine into chemical compounds. So if we take the example of water, um, there's various ways of showing the chemical bonds in water. But here's one. Um, the um, oxygen atom shares some of the electrons between the hydrogen atom. And um, these are shown as the white circles in the diagram. The red circles are the electrons just around the oxygen atom which aren't shared with hydrogen. This can also be shown in an even simpler way, where each line represents a pair of shared electrons. OK, the bonding found in water molecules is covalent bonding, one type of chemical bonding. There's also ionic bonding, where electrons are completely transferred from one atom to another rather than being shared. But also the forces between individual molecules themselves, which are much weaker than chemical bonds, are also results of the electrostatic force. So if you look at this picture, it shows the structure of liquid water. So as a whole, as we've seen, water has no electric charge. However, within the water molecule, the oxygen atom has a small negative charge. And the two hydrogen atoms each have a small positive charge. And this actually causes a weak force between the oxygen atom of a water molecule and the hydrogen atom of its neighbours. And it's this weak intermolecular force, which is called hydrogen bonding, means that uh, water is a liquid at room temperature. Energy needs to be supplied to break these hydrogen bonds and convert it into steam. The hydrogen bonding found in water is only one example of the intermolecular forces. There are other types, but they all have one thing in common, they're electrostatic in origin. In fact, all objects that we see in our day-to-day -day life are held together by electrostatic forces. Well, so far we've only discussed um, electrostatics, the forces between stationary charges. An electric current occurs when electrically charged particles, such as the electrons in a wire, move. When an electric current flows, it induces a magnetic field. When a magnetic field changes, it induces a voltage. It was one of the greatest achievements of 19th century science for scientists such as James Clerk Maxwell and Michael Faraday to unify electricity and magnetism, which have been thought of as being separate phenomena, into electromagnetism. Maxwell was able to show that electromagnetic radiation, such as light, was due to changing electric and magnetic fields. OK, well, let's talk about gravity next then. Gravity acts on anything with mass. It's always attractive. And like the electromagnetic force, electrostatic force, it follows an inverse square law. In fact, the formula for the strength of 
um, force due to gravity is very similar to the formula for the force due to the electrostatic force. If the masses in the formula m1 and m2 are in kilograms and the distance in meters, then the force once again will be in newtons. In this formula, g, big G as it's usually called, is the gravitational constant and it has the rather small value of 6.64 times 10 to the minus 11 in standard units. Gravity is extremely weak compared to the electrostatic force. If we take the example shown of a hydrogen atom which consists of a single proton orbited by a negatively charged electron, the mass of a proton is a minute 1.672 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. The mass of electron is nearly 2,000 times smaller. If we assume that the proton and the electron are 10 to the minus 10 meters apart, which is the typical separation in a hydrogen atom, then the gravitational force between the electron and proton is an almost imaginably, unimaginably small 10 to the minus 47 newtons. If we look at the electrostatic force between the proton and the ele electron, then it is 2.3 times 10 to the minus 8 newtons, 39 magnitudes, orders of magnitude greater. But the interesting thing is that uh, if gravity were much stronger relative to the electromagnetic force, the universe would be so different that we wouldn't exist. This illustrates that on atomic scales, gravity is just so weak it can be totally ignored. Even on the scales we are more used to in our everyday life, gravity is still unimportant. For example, if we take two one kilogram masses and place them a meter apart, the gravitational force between them is only 6.7 times 10 to the minus 11 newtons. If we go to much larger objects and consider the Earth and the Moon, the Earth has a mass of roughly 6 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. The moon has a mass roughly 80 times smaller and the mean distance between the earth and the moon is 384,000 kilometers. This means the gravitational force between the earth and the moon is 2 times 10 to the 20 newtons and it is this gravitational force which keeps the moon in orbit around the earth. However, if we look at the electrostatic force between the Earth and the Moon, the amount of positive and negative charge um, cancel each other out. So the Earth and the Moon have almost zero net electric charge. And the electrostatic force, which of course only acts on charged bodies, is effectively zero. As I'll explain later, the nuclear force and the weak interaction are very short range and it's only gravity which matters at large distances. The strong interaction only acts on particles which have a property which particle physicists have labelled colour charge. This actually has nothing to do with the everyday meaning of colour. It's just a label for this property. Colour charge can have three possible values, red, blue and green. And there's actually three anti-colours, which are anti-red, anti-blue and anti-green, which are normally represented as um, cyan, yellow and magenta. It's described by a very complicated theory called quantum chromodynamics. But in essence, what happens is um, a particle is attracted to another particle of a different colour. In this theory, the strong interaction is carried by virtual particles called gluons. The protons and neutrons we find in atomic nuclei aren't fundamental particles. They can be broken down further into quarks. There are actually six types of quarks known as flavours, which physicists have given the rather strange names of up, down, charm, strange, top and bottom. Only the up and down flavours are stable. 
quarks of the other flavour rapidly decay into an up or down quark. All quarks have a colour charge which must be red, blue or green. There's also six flavours of anti-quark, anti-up, anti-down, anti-charm, anti-strange, anti-top and anti-bottom. Each anti-quark will have a colour charge which is red, anti-red, anti-blue or anti-green or cyan, yellow, magenta as they're often shown. Isolated quarks are never found in nature. They're confined by the strong interaction, which is so strong that it binds them together into particles called hadrons. A hadron contains two or more quarks. For example, protons and neutrons both contain three quarks. A proton is made up of two up and one down quarks. These quarks are constantly changing colour, but at a given instant in time, there's always one red, one blue and one green quark within a proton. Um, when you combine red, blue and green colour charge, it makes a colour charge of white. So overall, the proton is colourless. That means it carries no colour charge. Neutrons have one up quark and two down quarks. Again, one is red, one is blue, and one is green. So the neutron is colourless overall as well. This diagram here just shows the uh, proton, um, the two ups and down quarks bound together in a, in a proton. And as I said before, there must always be one red, one blue, and one green. As we've seen, combining the colour charges of the red, blue and green quarks in a proton or neutron gives a colour charge of white, no colour charge. So therefore, we can assume that the strong interaction between two nucleons should be zero. And this is right, it's in general true. However, if two nucleons are very close together, and we mean here around about 10 to the minus 15 meters, we do get an interaction between them. This occurs when the quarks of one nucleon attract quarks of a different nucleon. So the red quark of a proton will be attracted to the blue and green quarks of an adjacent neutron. This is called the residual stronger interaction, or more commonly the nuclear force, and it's extremely short range. Its strength is effectively zero at only three times 10 to the minus 15 meters and is actually repulsive at very short distances. It's the nuclear force which binds together protons and neutrons into atomic nuclei. So an example of the nuclear force, let's consider a helium-4 nucleus, two protons, two neutrons. The blue line shows the repulsive force between the two protons pushing them apart. The red lines show the much stronger nuclear force holding all the nucleons together. I'll now give a brief summary of the weak interaction. It acts over very short distances, so 10 to the minus 17 to 10 to the minus 16 metres, so that's an extremely short distance. One of the things it does, it allows quarks to change flavour, so an up quark may become a down quark, or vice versa. The weak interaction as a result is responsible for beta decay. This diagram, which is called a Feynman diagram, shows a form of beta decay. A neutron, which consists of one up and two down quarks, is converted into a proton, which consists of two up and one down quark. In doing so, it emits an electron and an electron antineutrino. The particle label W- is called the W- boson and is extremely short-lived. One of the most famous examples of um, beta decay is when a carbon-14 nucleus changes into nitrogen, nitrogen-14. 
The half-life of this decay is 5,700 years and it's often used for radiocarbon dating. By the amount of carbon-14 left in an organic object, you can tell how old it is. So, just to summarise, we have electromagnetism, which gives rise to the electrostatic force between objects with electric charge. And it's this force which binds together atoms, molecules, and indeed everything we see in our day-to-day -day life. Gravity is much weaker than the electrostatic force and is only important on massive objects. And it's this force which together binds together things like asteroids, planets, stars, solar system, galaxies. The strong interaction is an attractive force between objects of different color charge. And it's this force which confines quarks into hadrons. For example, three quarks into a proton. But all objects we can see don't have color um, the strong interaction gives rise to a nuclear force, which is short range of force between protons and neutrons. And this force binds together protons and neutrons into atomic nuclei. And finally, we'll come to the weak interaction. And one effect of this is it changes the flavor of a quark, giving rise to beta decay. The weak interaction is unique amongst the four interactions. It doesn't bind anything together. There's no bound structures with the weak interaction.